Welcome to Artist and Critic again. Uh, I'm Don Gray. What we're doing here in, is having part two of what might be called a painter's view of uh, contemporary art history, uh, starting with Manet in the mid-1860s and coming right up to the present. We're going to take as long as we have to in order to discover the sources of contemporary art problems, to discover the source of, of traditions, perhaps, that have been debased in our own time, resulting in an art that is alienated from nearly every aspect of human experience. You know, human feeling, thought, relationship to our environment, to life, to spiritual goals. Uh, really, the field of painting has become uh, nothing much more than an arena where people kind of fiddle-diddle around with paints and materials and spread them and, and color them and play with them and manipulate them. Aesthetic manipulation uh, is the contemporary art god uh, at the expense of all the more profound values that have sustained the arts throughout the centuries. I mean, for art to be a significant human endeavor now as it has been uh, since man first started drawing animals on the caves, art once again has to do what it always did do. In one way or another, it, it expressed life. It expressed uh, mankind's reaction to life, their needs and their fears uh, in recognizable form, uh, in more or less one way or another. Even in the early Christian uh, period when all of the arts of the Greeks and Romans were lost and art became spiritualized. I mean, still the saints and the sinners and the Christ and God were uh, recognizable as such. It was meaningful art creation, not dabbling in a red against a green or this kind of texture against that kind of texture, but the creation of art that expresses the human dream and the human agony. To, now we're so removed from ourselves and the experience of ourselves were so debased that art really has come to ground zero in a time of great decadence. So, continuing with our painter's view of art history, we go back to Manet and we look at a painting of Bertha Morisot, uh, his friend, uh, I presume his student, his admirer, uh, his supporter. And she, as you can see, is an extremely uh, attractive woman uh, quite a good painter herself, although not up to Manet's stature as, as a forceful artist. Uh, this shows Manet at his best as an intimate portraitist, revealing character, revealing a sense of the life force coming out of uh, Ms. Morisot in her eyes, the sensitive mouth. And what a beautiful, exquisite patterning of the dark hat the neck piece and the dress that uh, make a beautiful abstract pattern, if you will, that set off the delicately human face. And we can say the influence of Japanese prints is apparent here as well as Manet's own predilection for patterns. We go to the next uh, painting by Manet entitled The Plum, painted in 1877. And here we have a painting of a rather uh, lonely, self-involved young woman sitting at a marble table, exquisitely painted, the marble patterning. And we look at, say, the hand, and we see it painted in typically broad Manet fashion, almost without even a, a thumbnail on it, and the beautiful structure of the body. But this picture has a certain depth of soul, a certain sense of the inner person who faces problems, feels problems, and meditates on them, perhaps almost unable to move and solve them in a sense. It may not be too stretching the point too much because in 1877, Manet is suffering from the illness that will kill him in uh, 1883, or it will be slightly making its way uh, upon him, or 1881 rather. And uh, as a youth, Manet, before he became an artist, was uh, in the Navy as a young naval cadet and uh, probably picked up a venereal disease and in one of those very unfair shafts of God, uh, the venereal disease will appear in later life, a syphilis presumably, and slowly kill Manet. Uh, 
They'll have locomotor ataxia, which I presume is when the nerves slowly stop functioning and, and one is unable to move. And on his late pictures, particularly the Foley's Berger, which we'll see a little bit later, um, he had to lie down and then drag himself to the easel and paint for a few moments and then collapse in exhaustion only to try to rise again. And he painted a masterpiece. And perhaps it isn't too uh, far-fetched to see some of Manet's suffering in the painting. Now, there's a certain trend of paintings like this at this time and in the late 19th century. And you may join with me as we look at them in wondering if they don't somehow express some of the malaise of the end of the century as people face the fearful unknown of the upcoming 20th century as they face the, a certain uh, closing in of the industrial age on them at the time. Certainly we feel the pressures of it today. I mean, they were living in some of the early manifestations of it, certainly feeling some of the problem. Uh, in this painting by Van Gogh, post-impressionist whom we'll look at, at we, we need to get the picture much, much bigger than it is now we've somehow lost our focal point. There we go. That's terrific. In this portrait by Van Gogh of, of Dr. Gachet, with whom Van Gogh found refuge the last six months of his life in Auvers in France, uh, Van Gogh painted this doctor with what he's called the heartbroken expression of our time. Now we can say that it's both Van Gogh's heartbroken expression after suffering a lifetime of frustration, although he did create many masterpieces. It could be Dr. Gachet's own personal sense of frustration as a doctor who wants to be an artist and a, a doctor who is eccentric to the point of imbalance. Uh, or it can be the pressure of that mankind generally feels through the encroaching of mass societies in a sense that will repress the individual, the loss of tradition that will leave mankind feeling rootless as we do in our own time. Uh, all of it is incipient and beginning at this early stage. Let's go to another example of this possibly. Uh, Van Gogh's painted in 1890. Here we look at Edgar Degas' Woman with Chrysanthemums and painted in 1865. Uh, Degas, an Impressionist and a member of the Impressionist group, although not an Impressionist in the same way that Monet is, for example, in terms of broken color, and at this stage, not really an Impressionist at all, possibly. But here we have a woman in a similar pensive study in the same way that Manet's Woman with the Plum, the same way of uh, Van Gogh's Dr. Gachet, in a magnificent psychological symbolic relationship, the flowers next to the woman become her inner life, in a sense. The throbbing, richness, uh, clanging of her inner chimes, if one wants to uh, put it that way, as her psychological processes, her thought processes, interact with inside the, the thinking facade of her own face. The picture's kind of lost in the lower center of the screen. Maybe we can, maybe we can bring it up. Okay, we're going to go to another picture. We're going to go to another picture. And uh, we can keep them centered, perhaps, and, and we can see them a little bit better. But uh, we go to an artist, well, we go to Degas again, as a matter of fact, and his painting uh, Absinthe. And we see a certain sense of alienation again in a couple. Uh, we saw single figures, but couples reappear. And I don't want to say that, that couples are totally alienated at that time, because they aren't, because we can find uh, couples by Renoir, who are happily dancing and, and mutually exchanging feelings and ideas. But here there's a sense of separation. The woman is lost in herself, dejected, in somewhat the same sense of mayonnaise, woman with the plum. The man is, is, is separated from the woman. Perhaps he's bored. Perhaps he's looking around for something more exciting to do. And it's a rather drab, dreary, suffering picture that we can say that it's of a particular social group. Perhaps the woman's a a laundress who works part-time as a prostitute, you know, to eke out a living, and the man is, is uh, uh, ready to move on from her to a, another prostitute or some uh, rather poor, afflicted young creature. So we go to the next picture, and uh, we see another couple painted by Toulouse-Lautrec, uh, a similar, seedy, slightly bohemian underworld couple. 
uh, where the man uh, looks like a drunk of long standing. <laughs> He's rather bleary eyed at, at the moment. And the woman, in this instance, is turning away from the man. See, you know, he says, My God, surely I can find a better situation than living with this uh, drunken old sot, as amusing as he can be sometimes in his cups. You know, that kind of thing. But here we have uh, a, a sense of, of couples that are, are split in a sense, as if it almost uh, were suggesting uh, a split personality in a sense. We, we could go into Jungian terms and talk about anima and animus, I suppose, but I, I think that's probably unnecessary at this point. But here we have another couple in a magnificent painting by the Impressionist Renoir, uh, his painting in 1874, Lautrec's in 1891 that we looked at. Pierre Renoir, the Impressionist contemporary of, of Monet and Degas, somewhat younger than uh, Manet. And a painting by the Loge, an early Impressionist painting, painting of the, called the Loge. And we sense this separation again of women, generally speaking, being depicted as more sensitive and suffering than the men. The women have more a sense of, of personality, generally speaking, of rich interior space, if that doesn't sound a little corny, I guess it does. And the men are more superficial. They're more extroverted in the sense of, of looking out, as this man does with his glasses, scanning the tears of the opera and so forth to uh, find something to satisfy his restless gaze, heart, or you know whatever. But a very beautiful picture in the luscious uh, lights and darks, the striping that makes such a beautiful pattern, but uh, psychological statements in a sense. Okay, we go to the next uh, picture. Uh, one by Manet, a self-portrait uh, right at the end of his life, uh, painted in 1879. Uh, he'll be die, die in, uh, well maybe it is 1883, I'm a little uncertain, 1881, 1883, but, but he's close. And die, he'll die at the age of uh, 51. And this one is at the Metropolitan. I don't know if it's always there. I, I don't always see it, but it's a masterpiece of free, suggestive painting. It, we can't really see the brushwork, but it's so freely, richly done. The color is, is richer in the original. Uh, but Manet gets a slight sense of his own personality, a certain interior quality in it, uh, somewhat similar perhaps to the woman with the plum, a little less reverie and more intensity perhaps appropriate to uh, a creative individual, but uh, a wonderful evocation of the artist as a creator, and uh, really a, a very marvelous picture. Uh, we go to the next uh, work by Manet, will be his final masterpiece, perhaps his uh, bar at the Folies Bergère, where a single woman waiting at the uh, bar waits to serve her customer, who can be seen in the upper right uh, in a slight distortion. We see the, the woman's back, uh, the back of the girl who waits on us. And that's far enough. We don't need to get too much off the picture. And this picture could be handled in a number of ways. But Manet chooses to do it in such a way that the individual is thrust into the foreground, and there's a certain lonely presentation of herself, a certain isolation from the throng mirrored in the background in some marvelous painting passages by Manet where figures are suggested just to the left of the girl's shoulder. You can see a woman with her uh, holding her opera glasses, all painted in the most fluid, luscious, rich painterly paint. And of course, a magnificent still life on the bar in the foreground. But one might say, without reading too much in it, that this is one of the deeper psychological studies, the, one of the deeper moments of Manet's probing into the human soul. Generally, he's concerned and satisfied with outward appearances, giving him the excuse to uh, manipulate luscious, wonderful paint. But here, perhaps, as he's forced to face his own destiny, dying from this hideous uh, attack of uh, syphilis late in his, his life, uh, it comes through into his painting. Okay, we go to the next picture and look at the contrast of Renoir's 
Moulin de la Galette, an outdoor dance hall and restaurant in Paris. Look at the thronging together of happy people, the, the joining of pure animal spirits, and, and just human joy in companionship and fellowship. And think of that poor isolated girl in the bar of the Folies Bergere. And I would imagine that you have a certain sense of the feeling of Manet <coughs> slowly dying on his couch in his studio. OK, we're going to go to uh, Claude Monet now as a member of the Impressionist movement and as a uh, beautiful painter in his own right, somewhat different than Manet. And in the initial painting, we actually see uh, Monet as depicted by the artist uh, Renoir. Uh, Claude Monet and Pierre Renoir painted together uh, a great deal, particularly early in their careers. And we see uh, Monet, perhaps in a picture that does not not tremendously reveal his character, uh, but there's a certain sense of, of stubbornness. There's a level gaze to the man as if he will see something through to the end. And of course, we're speaking from hindsight, so we have a, a perfect <laughs> chance to interpret the man psychologically. Uh, Monet was a stubborn, tough cookie. And despite his sufferings, his endless uh, lack of money, uh, the fact that his first wife died of tuberculosis, I believe, and her death was speeded up because of, through malnutrition because he didn't have enough money to uh, take care of her and uh, uh, nourish her as much as possible. Uh, Monet was, in one sense, the heart and soul of Impressionism. As uh, uh, Renoir said, uh, you know, without Monet, we would have been lost because of his heart, in a sense. And uh, where, as Monet came from humble surroundings, Manet was a boulevardier, uh, a man of a certain amount of independent wealth, a, a sophisticate, in a sense, who held himself away from the other painters to a great extent. OK, we'll go to the next uh, uh, painting. And a little bit of a contrast of character. Here we have a self-portrait by Van Gogh. Perhaps we can center them a little bit. And there we go. And uh, we see some of the fire of the creative spirit, some of the intensity of Van Gogh. And while Monet is a tremendous worker, he never stopped painting. And one would suspect that there's a, a creative intensity in him. Obviously, Van Gogh is in a special case by himself, although Van, uh, Monet can paint with a great deal of, of vigor and vitality, sometimes echoing Van Gogh almost in the intensity of his work, particularly in his later paintings. We look at this early uh, Monet, and we can see entitled Women in the Garden, uh, painted in 1867. And we remember Manet's Lunch in the Grass, painted in 1863 or so. We can see Monet uh, being inspired by Manet. And uh, the figure will be important in, early in Monet's work, but will uh, fall away later in his career. And we go to the next picture, and it's simply a reminder of Manet's Luncheon in the Grass, which we can uh, briefly look at and get the idea of people sitting in a landscape environment. OK, we go to the next uh, picture, and this is an early beauty by Monet entitled Terrace at San Andres, uh, sometimes called Terrace at Le Havre. Uh, it's in the Metropolitan Museum, painted in 1867. And there's a magnificent freshness of color. One can almost feel the breeze coming off that beautiful, clear sea. And the, the, and the painting is, is painted so deftly and solidly and simply. Uh, this is the picture that the Metropolitan acquired for some incredible figure, 1,450,000, something of the sort, and uh, for which uh, Monet was paid the paltry sum. And as paltry, even if it weren't compared to 1,450,000, 35 francs, you know, which is, you know, who knows, I, I don't know the exchange rate, but say something like 8 or $10, something like that. And which points out, again, the incredible unfairness that artists must face in the 
uh, reception of their work and that I suppose mature artists come to realize that it's just simply something that they must deal with and that's the reality of life as an artist that uh, too often you don't reap these tremendous uh, financial rewards but I would also say that any artist worth his salt is as interested in, in creative uh, rewards as he is in, in the financial aspects of it. But in looking at this picture we might keep in mind the broadness the ha of the handling of the paint, a certain solidity and simplicity of form which will become increasingly diffused as his work moves along and his brush strokes will turn into little dots and commas and strokes and sometimes long looping strokes. His works will get a little bit softer. There's a, a beautiful strength here that, that uh, won't be apparent in his later works. Okay, we go to the next picture and perhaps we'll have a comparison here of some of the fuzzier, softer feeling. And, and this does give a feeling of it. In his Banks of the Seine, painted in 1880, uh, 13 years later, we, we get a sense of the beautiful, airy, atmospheric quality of it and, and the, certainly the softness of the foliage. Uh, Monet is a master of atmosphere, of paint, of color, of getting the sparkle uh, in reality, the visual reality of a scene. I'm sure you've heard the, the saying about Van Gogh, he's on, uh, I'm sorry, Monet, he's only an eye, but what an eye, you know, in the sense that he, he only sees things, he doesn't put in his, his soul into it, but boy does he really see them in his own way. Okay, we go to the next picture, and we see another beautiful early picture at the t painted, uh, in the same year of Terrace at San Andres, it's Beach at San Andres. And the tremendous sparkle of the atmosphere, the light in the picture, a simple direct expression of reality that really had not been attained before this time. We could think of perhaps Bonington in England, Constable in England, and Turner in England and that would give a lie to what I just said, that it hadn't been seen before. But Monet puts his own particular uh, signature on pictures like this. Briefly, one other early one. We go to his bridge at Argentille uh, for the fresh, lovely, broad handling of the painting. This is not his soft, fuzzy uh, later stages, but the extremely fresh. Uh, it's the miracle of nature uh, transcribed by a sensitive eye. This is perhaps an ultimate in pure visual realism. And these pictures are, you know, compared to what's happening today, uh, artists are simply, have, have lost contact with all of this. They're unable to make significant art from reality, whether it's in Monet's way or in Van Gogh's way, so to speak. Okay, we go to the next picture, and we see uh, Monet's impression, sunrise impression, sunset, painted about 1872 and it will be exhibited in the Impressionist exhibition of 1874. It will be part of the scandal of the, the exhibition when all of the hell of the French Academy, the, the official critics will come descending on the heads of the Impressionists just the way it happened to Manet. And again, it's an example of a contemporary establishment clinging to the status quo, fighting off any fresh creative ideas. And the creative ideas here, of course, are simply a fresh, spontaneous response to nature, painted very freely. A picture like this is very, very thinly painted and it becomes very uh, evocative. There's that word again, kind of moody, kind of poetic and extremely fresh. Okay, we go to the next picture. And one might say, we spoke of Joseph Turner earlier. Uh, Monet saw Turner but work, but it's uncertain what influence it had on his work. But certainly Turner, in this instance, the burning of the Houses of Parliament, painted in 1835, is exploring the cosmic nature of life in the sense of an explosive event where the flames are sort of the flames of creation themselves, in a sense. We'll come back next time and study, talk more about the development of 
19th century painting, interspersing it with modern works, and a continuing discussion of a painter's view of art history. Uh, my name is Don Gray. Program is artist and critic. Thanks very much for being with us. Bye -bye.